This speaker is named Neville Johnson, and um, he is an end times, uh, last days minister of God. What? Who walks with Jesus? He sees him physically, uh, almost on a daily basis for the past 50 years, and until up until he, at least until he passed away in September of 2019. And he's still working on the other side of the veil for the Lord, so he's not really, he's not here, but he's, he's still alive, so... But he, he teaches about the, the Antichrist, one world government, cashless society, World War III, Mark of the Beast, one world religion, false prophet, tribulation, the rapture, the two witnesses, and everything in the, that's in Revelation, and oh, well, most things that are Re Revelation or in, in Daniel. Um, and, um, He's been translated all over the place by God, He's caught up in many visions. He has thousands and thousands of different experiences that he shares when he speaks. It's just to teaching us how to uh, press into God and to really trust and believe in God here in this, in this next decade, because there'll be a tremendous amount of events happening quickly that people won't understand. And this is just so that we won't be shocked out of our socks and so that we would be strong towers for ourselves, our families, and our communities, our churches. Because a lot of, this is going to be billions of people that won't know about the things that he teaches about. But we don't have to be surprised, and we don't have to be, we're shocked. We're remnant. We're chosen. We're the sons and daughters of God, the elect, and we sit with the Lord in high places. And um, he explains how we're going to be able to survive these, these last days, the end. In time started when two two thousand years ago, when approximately two thousand years ago, when the Lord came to Earth. Now we're in the tail end of the last days, so keep learning. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Do that now. Check out the playlist on this channel. It's End Times playlist. Get yourself up to speed if you're not already, and get knowledgeable and uh, listen to something every single day, so that you can cram in as much information as you possibly can and give a thumbs up also too so other people around the world get this vital information go ahead and subscribe god bless you and uh keep learning we talked in our last session about the omnipresence of god and how important that is to understand that today we're going to continue a little more with that and we're going to look at how to break through the veil into the presence of the Lord. You know, there are levels of relationship um, with the omnipresence of the Lord. It says in Acts chapter 4, 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them because they that they had been with Jesus. In other words, there was something different about them because they'd been with Jesus. So, we must value at the, as a priority spending time in the manifold felt presence of the Lord. And so, we're talking about how to get into that, how to move into that, learning to walk with God now. Now, it's very, very interesting because there were three levels of the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament, in the... In the um, the tabernacle that Moses built, there was the outer court, which was a big area. Um, and there was a certain manifestation awareness of the presence of the Lord. Then there was another department where they went through into the holy place, where the candlestick was, the showbread. And that was another level of relationship with the Lord. We could call that Pentecost, if you like. The, the lampstand and so on. And uh, a lot of people live there today, um, and that's important, and it's good, but there was one uh, more level, a smaller area, which was called the holiest of all, and it was the manifest presence of God, the manifest presence of God. Now, it's interesting, that was at the far end of the tabernacle, you got the outer court, come into the holy place and then there was one more place. The problem was there were two things blocking the way. There was an altar of incense which was in the far end of the holy place 
and there was a veil. Now that veil in the temple was not some flimsy little curtain. It was about this thick. No way physical hands could tear that. But when Jesus died on the cross, a very unusual thing happened, literally happened in the temple. When Jesus died on the cross, probably an angel or whoever tore the veil from top to bottom. In other words, a way was made so that we can enter into that place. But we have to find our way in. They, we, you can't get into the holiest of all, the last compartment, without getting past the altar of incense. That was at the far end, blocked away, actually. And behind that was a veil. You couldn't get through. So, the outer court is your physical body. The holy place is your soul. But there's another place, the holiest of all. So, altar of incense. You gotta get past it. What does incense mean? How does that work? It says in Revelation 8, 3, it says... And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer that was given unto him with much incense in it, right? That he should offer it with, with, along with the prayers of the saints upon the altar, which was before the throne. So here we have an angel came, and he's got this golden censer. In the censer, there's smoke coming out. It's, there's incense there. And, and, and offer it for that along with something else with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar and the smoke it says of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints two things smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angels hands so we see that prayer and is an intercession is referred as incense. First, there's the smoke, which had a smell, and second was the prayers. Now, in the last book of the Old Testament, in Malachi 1 and verse 11, it says, From the rising of the sun, from the beginning of time, to the end of time, to the sun going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Now, He's, you know, refer, he's not just referring to Jewish people. He's referring to Gentiles. And this is Old Testament. From the rising of the sun, even going down to the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place across this planet, incense shall be offered in my name as a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord. They, they get past the altar of incense. It's much. It's more than prayer. Prayer is a part of it. Intercession is a part of it. But, listen to me, the person themselves must become the incense. The two things, there was prayers and the person. The person must become the incense. In other words, incense has a smell. And um, there's no other way to say this, but you've got to smell right to get through into the holiest of all. A manifest presence of God. Not just the felt presence, but the manifest presence of God. In the holiest of all, you got to smell right. Not just your prayer. So how does this work? Pure incense is not, as I say, but words. It comes from an inner condition. A pure of soul, you see. A pure offering, it says, shall be offered in my name in every place in the earth. The sun is going down. It's the end of the age. And we can't get into that place, that ultimate place with the Lord, unless we pass the altar of incense. The door will open. Let me tell you something. The door will open when you smell right. So, no. How does that work? Well, 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 it says, Now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the savor. That word savor is the word smell. Fragrance actually. Osme is the word. It, it is a Greek word. Osme. Fragrance. Literally odor. So it's saying, you know, now thanks be to God which always causes us to triumph in everything in Christ, maketh manifest our smell of his knowledge by us in every place. So, but we are unto God, 2 Corinthians 2, 15, we are unto God a sweet savor. That word savor is smell. How did that work? We are unto God a sweet smell of Christ in them that are saved. This is not just figurative language. It means what it says. And it's saying what it means. 2 Corinthians 2, 16, the next verse. To the one, we can either be a smell of death, and to the other, a smell of life. What are you emanating? Life or death? Whatever you emanate affects your physical body. Smell of life brings resurrection life. And smell, savor, it's the same word. Scentedness, strong odor, fragrance. So, Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love, as Christ also loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice to God, or a sweet-smelling savor, odor. Sense, smell. So it's obvious in the spirit realm we give off a smell. Philippians four eighteen, but I have all, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, which happened to be a smell, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable unto God. Every sacrifice we make we make for the Lord create a smell incense sacrifice unselfish actions each fruit of the spirit has a smell has a sound a vibration an actual sound and a color you know it's important to understand this I had a funny experience, the funny experience in Acts chapter 19. I was reading Acts chapter 19, and, I, and it says, and I'll read it to you, Acts 19, four, verse 14. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priests which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they, they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And I was reading this and I thought, Lord, what was that like? What was really going on here? And he said to me, the Lord said to me, that's what put me on to this whole thing. He said, they didn't smell right and their color was wrong. The what? Didn't smell right. In other words, this guy was trying to cast out demons, and one demon was saying, I don't know about this guy. He doesn't smell right. He doesn't, he's not em emanating the right color, right? I, he doesn't have the authority to cast this out. Let's beat him up. And that's exactly what happened. Interesting, isn't it? Isaiah 61 verse 3 says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of mourning, and the garment or covering of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Very interesting. Praise, you see, is a covering. The oil of joyful mourning and the garment covering of praise dispelling the spirit of heaviness this covering of praise here is the greek word uh, tehillah 
from the root word halal, and it means to shine with sound and color. When we praise God, we just we, when we are worshiping, praising God, it's we emanate in the spirit realm. It's very clear: a sound and a color and a smell. They in the Solomon's temple where they began to praise the Lord. And all of them make one sound of the Lord, the power of God fell. See, so we come when we stand before the altar of incense and we're giving off light, sound, color. We're giving off an incense. And unless you smell right, that veil will not part for you. And you cannot get in the holiest of all, into the manifest presence of God. That's the key. There is a key. The key is a smell, a color, a sound. It gives you access. So, God wants us to get to this next level. You know, the armor of light is something which comes not from the outside, from it. it comes from the inside to the outside. Armor of light. Put on the whole armor that you might stand against the wiles of the devil, withstanding the evil day in which we now live. You know, Esther had, had three levels where she was, come before she could enter the king's house. She had to smell right. She was in that idol court where she was bathing and doing all kinds of stuff and scents and stuff. Then she was in another house, another level where that continued on for, I think it was nine months, something like that. And finally she ended up in the king's house. Every attribute of the Lord gives off light, color, smell. But love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, meekness, kindness, faith, all emanating sense. And see, when you get, uh, we're in Pentecost in the holy place, but if you want to get into the next level, you know, smell right. It's really who you are. Meekness, temperance against there is such no law. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Who you are determines the smell which then mingles with your prayers parts the veil. You must have the smell of the presence of the Lord on you. So understanding this is really important. You cannot get into the holiest of all, that relationship with the Lord, the Holy of Holies, unless you get past the altar of incense. Until you get past the altar of incense, the veil will not break for you. You have to have the right key down in color and smell. He is the level of the Lord that you are emanating. That's the key. You know, in John chapter 14, 21, it says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And listen, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. That word manifest is one of the strongest words you can get. It means to up, literally appear. It's an emphansio, which means in the Greek to exhibit in person, to disclose, to appear, to manifest openly. Oh, there are three levels there. The other court, holy place, the manifest presence of the Lord. Now, the outer court, you might sense some of the presence of the Lord, but you don't really have much of a relationship. There's another level, the second level. Your imagination uses, you use your imagination to connect with the Lord. That's the second level, and you must proceed in that. Third level is you break through by whom you are becoming. You have a key that breaks to the next level which is the visible manifestation of the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3, you'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in you. 
imagination in the spirit realm is three. But there's at that level where he will manifest himself openly. In John 14, 14, 22, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, that's love. He it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father. Listen, and I will love him and manifest myself, openly manifest myself to him. You can't be changed by doing. You can do all good works, but you can't be changed by doing. You're changed by being in the presence of the Lord. Malachi prophet that as prophesied that as we've seen it. You know, the omnipresence of the Lord is a total unveiling of the Lord in its fullness. If you include him in your life, he will include you in his life. You have to foster this awareness. You know, I often get emails, get asked about tattoos. You know, well, you know, what a tattoo should we have them? Are they good, bad, whatever? Well, you know, in Leviticus, Leviticus 1927, it says, you shall not round the corners of your heads. That's a hairstyle. Neither thou mar the corners of your beard. Well, what was he talking about? The, the Canaanites used certain hair, hairstyles and certain shapes, certain aspects of their beard, the, the shape of their beard, which em, emulated um, demon gods. And um, so he said, you can't do that. Don't do that. that. But then he went on to say, in Leviticus nineteen twenty, and you shall not might make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, for I am the Lord. Now I know we're getting into a bit of deep water here because a lot of you have tattoos, okay? Some tattoos, tattoos are, are, are simply okay, others are not. Some, you know, are just you might have a tattoo of a dove or what, but, you know, well, why? I don't know. I was in a particular part of heaven earlier this year. There was a doorway, which I knew was a door to another realm in heaven, but I couldn't get the door open. Pushed it, tried it. I did everything but kick it. And I could, it wouldn't open. And there was this angel standing quite amused, looking at me. And he just simply said, you don't have the key, do you? And I thought, no, I don't have a key. And so I thought, oh, well, that faded out. That didn't work. And um, quite a few months after that, it was about six or nine months sometime after that, I had an encounter with one of the cloud of witnesses. And he said, give me your hand. And so I said, okay. And he stamped something on my hand. And I looked at it. And it looked a bit like a Hebrew symbol, but I don't think it was. I think it was more than that. Um, but you could only see it in the realm of the spirit. And I thought, oh, okay. I didn't fully understand that. It was when you see it in the realm of the spirit, like I can see it now, it, it has light around it. And I thought, well, I'm not quite sure what that's all about. But then the next time I found myself in front of that door later in the year, I pushed the door and it didn't open. This angel still looking at me. And the angel said, show the back of your hand. And when I went like this, the door opened. I thought, oh, I need some scriptural validation for this. You know, it's interesting in Genesis chapter 4, 15, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. So, and the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Obviously, it was a visible mark. And whatever that was, people were afraid to kill him. Okay, in Ezekiel 9, 4, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, set a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the midst of the city. 
And he said unto them, Defile the house, fill the courts with the slain, go forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. So he put a mark on their forehead. Those who had the mark on their forehead were people who were in crying for the abominations of the city. If you didn't have it, they were killed. Revelation 14, 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, with him 144,000, having their father's name written on their forehead. You know, it's very interesting, and we'll have to close now short, shortly. But during the charismatic move, um, it was, um, how can I say, it was uh, the fad picked from, from men, particularly in the heavy movie, to have long hair. And it was a symbol of rebellion against this society, basically, and just a symbol of rebellion. But people, we had in our church, lots of people get hippies getting saved, we had long hair. And I was praying for this guy who needed deliverance, who later became a pastor, but he, he was out of the hippie movement. He was pretty bright, but he was out of the hippie movement. Now. And I was praying for deliverance from him, this demon wouldn't come out. And I thought, well, I don't know what else to do. And I heard the Lord say, cut his hair. I thought, don't be kidding, cut his hair. Why? Because it is a symbol of rebellion. Today it's not necessarily a symbol of rebellion, but in the hippie movement it was. So I said to him, look, this is the situation. This he said, well, cut my hair right there in the room. I went down, got some scissors, cut his hair, and the demon came out just like that. And I thought, well, that's interesting, you know, symbols, tattoos can be counterfeits, which open doors on the dark side. For instance, hell's, hell's angels, they, those, those tattoos open the realm of the spirit, but the dark side are the graphic designs. And so we need to kind of understand that they cannot be a counterfeit unless there is a real. You can't counterfeit a $3 bill because they don't exist. So you can only counterfeit that which is real. So just a while, some while ago, I was shown something in connection with the mark of the beast, and we'll close with this. But it was, it's what I saw, I was shown, was a scientist who emerged out of the Middle East. Now, I don't know if he was Jewish, Arab, or what, but he emerged in the Middle East. And um, he was able to put together a chip, which was a biochip. It had a, a cell in it, biological cell in the chip. And as I began to be aware of that, I thought, oh, okay, that was a chip. And the mark of the beast came before me very clearly. I began to think about it. But then I was shown that, that be, because the chip, it was a very powerful chip and it changed a lot of technology because of the speed of this chip. And so, it also had some sinister things attached to it. For instance, when the person reached a certain age, because they become not so a bit useless to society and too costly to keep in hospital and so on, somewhere around the age of 60, when it comes to the, about that age, the, the biochip released a virus which killed the person, just like that. And I thought, ooh. That was, that's just about what we're talking about in these last days and the mark of the beast. Oh, but he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow, the protection of the Lord. You need to learn how to walk with God. It's time to move on to the next level, to the next place. And it's all to do with character, who we are. You're going to smell right to get into the next level. 
you have to have the attributes that produce incense that will open the door for you to move on we're talking about holiness righteousness fruit of the spirit incense who we are is the incense so that will open to us the door to the next level beyond Pentecost to the manifest presence of the Lord Subscribe to the channel and check out the playlist, the End Times playlist. Get up to speed. Listen to something every day. Catch up. It's time to catch up. You guys, have a great day in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So give a give a like or a thumbs up also too, so other people around the world can learn. We are a remnant. We are the sons and daughters of God, the chosen, the elect.